This is the sixth in a series of 12 introductory videos that are accompanying my book called Teaching in a Digital Age. And I'd like to thank the Commonwealth of Learning for uh, making these videos possible. The, the, this Adverna support is a topic that goes right through the book, in fact. And um, what I've done is to pull out certain parts from certain chapters. Um, but obviously, learner support is such a critical thing of teaching that uh, it's dealt with in many parts in the book. Um, the aim of the 12 videos is, is to provide a brief introduction to the main themes in the book. And you can access the book from this URL. Um, the book is uh, on the BC campus in British Columbia website. Uh, BC campus has an open textbook project which enabled me to uh, make this an open textbook. Um, this video concentrates on learner support and particularly chapters 4.4, 6.6, 12.9 .6, .6, and 12.10. And I will get through this in 10 minutes, I, trust me. First of all, the need for structure. This is important for all learners, whether they're face-to-face -face or online or blended, but it's particularly important for students studying online. Uh, because there's no regular schedule of campus-based classes, we probably forget the discipline involved in turning up every day for a lecture. Um, that doesn't exist in an online uh, environment unless you build that structure into the online teaching. Um, and secondly, they don't have casual meetings with faculty where they bump into people and so on. Um, so if they're, if they're fully online, they're pretty isolated. So they need some kind of structure. And that means providing regular work for them daily or weekly. And this is especially important for people who've never studied online before or who are not very uh, independent learners. So they not very good at managing their own learning. So you have to provide some help at least initially but the good news is that this is a teachable skill and you can do it like any skill by introducing them gently to it and then increasing the amount of online learning. The best way to provide a structure is still using a learning management system or a virtual learning environment such as Blackboard or Moodle or desire to learn Think of the uh, learning management system as your online campus, which is where all the classes are, and particularly what students have to do each week. Uh, it's important to give clear instructions for online learners about what to do from the very beginning. Uh, in fact, it's probably a good idea to do that for students uh, on campus, but it's particularly important for students online. Set expectations. Many online learners or many people go online thinking it's going to be less work because they don't have to work so hard. In fact, it's the opposite. It's often more work for students. So set expectations about the amount of work they have to do and make that clear to students and make it clear when they have to submit work as well. Um, it's really important for online learners to build in regular weekly student activities. These can be uh, readings that they have to go and do online um, tests, discussion, projects, assignments. In some sense, it depends on your method of teaching and what's important in your teaching. But in terms of online learners and getting them to uh, work in a structured way, it doesn't really matter so long as they have something regularly to do each week. And the other thing that is good about this is actually you want to get the students doing the work. They're the ones having to learn. So provide plenty of activities for the students. And this is an example of a learning management system. This is desire to learn. And you'll see down the left hand side is uh, each week. So the students would click on whatever week they, they're coming up to. And that would open up and show them something like this, the course syllabus, uh, topics and so on that they, they need to cover in the week. So a learning management system is very good for, for providing that structure for students. Now, what does instructors need to do? Well, especially for online learners, you need to be there. Um, 
The research on this is very clear. The most successful online courses are where the instructor's presence was very clear to the students. The students like to know that you're actually watching what they're doing, um, that you're interested in whatever they're doing, that you're giving feedback on it, and so on. It doesn't mean to say you have to interact with every student every day, but at least once a week, there should be some interaction between you and maybe a group of students, but just so long as all the students know that you're watching what they're doing. The, there are a number of activities there. Um, uh, you can see that, that an instructor needs to do. Scaffolding is adding help with difficult concepts, giving guidance on activities. Uh, it is more detail about scaffolding in the book, but it's a very important thing for instructors to do and not just with online students, but with face-to-face -face students as well, but particularly important when they're online. And obviously give feedback on students' work as much as you can. And again, there are other parts of the book where I suggest how you can organize that feedback so you're not overworked, that you, you can manage it. And make use of other students helping each other. Again, this is a, what I would call an epistemological position about how you think learners uh, learn best. I think that learners learn very well in, in a social context and you can provide that online through online discussion forums or project work. Um, and again, one of the things you can do going online is create an, a, a culture online. And I, I like to encourage a culture of cooperation and I actually like to give guidelines to students on online behavior, what's acceptable and what isn't, um, so that they, they know what's expected of them. The most important thing is to manage students' workload. It's very easy to overload students. This is true of face-to-face -face courses as, as, as much as online, but it's especially important online because it, the more activities you add, the more their workload goes up. So I think you need to set a notional weekly workload. And this will vary in the context in which you work. But it doesn't seem to me to be an unreasonable assumption to make that students should study for about, if they're full time, should study about 35 to 40 hours a week. Now you can set whatever average you like but you, you should decide on an average and then work out how many courses they're taking at the same time and break the 35 to 40 hours a week evenly across the courses. So if they're doing four or five courses, then that works out about eight to 10 hours work per week per course. Now that covers everything. It's not just whatever lectures you stream to them. It's all the content, all the activities and any work for assignments or, or for exams that they do. Um, and, and, and that's a good discipline for you as the teacher because it, it sets your, pro you need to set priorities of what it's important for students to do. Um, and students must keep on schedule. So you need to give them an activity at least a, once a week of some kind that you can check on that, to see that they've done it. And again, you don't have to do that every week for every student, but students like to know um, that you're actually tracking what they're doing. And that's one of the great things about online learning. It's very transparent. You can see what each student is doing, what they're contributing, if they're doing assignments, what they've done on the assignments, uh, how, how they're behaving in discussion forums and so on. Um, but you need to manage their workload. And you have to manage your workload as well. Um, there are various ways to manage your workload. One of the things you can do online is objective testing. If you want students, test students on their understanding or their memory, then you can use computer marked assignments. And you can set those up in a learning management system. It instructs you on how to do this and you, you can choose the questions and it will randomly um, spin the questions so that students get different questions at different times. Um, and again, this is not always possible, but the optimum instructor student ratio, if you're teaching online, for me is around somewhere between one to 25, one instructor for 25 to 30 students. And I realize that isn't realistic for many 
uh, courses that have to go online. But uh, one thing you can do is build a course as the main instructor and then hire adjunct students for the extra students. So you might have a class of 120 where you teach one of the sectors and three adjuncts teach the others. Or what I would prefer is you teach, you don't actually deliver one of the courses, you design it and you moderate what the adjuncts do and the adjuncts do all the interaction with students. Uh, so with larger classes, I would tend to break them up in group. If you haven't got an adjunct, for instance, I will break them up into groups, say of 15 to 20 students. Um, ask students to take turns to lead. Uh, maybe once a month, you, this, a different student takes charge. Um, when I say lead, in other words, they take some kind of responsibility for um, getting all the students to participate. You can give grades for this if you wish. Um, I don't like to give grades for group work for individuals in group work, but I do want them to have some encouragement to participate. Um, and one way of handling group work is to have, say, a project that might extend over a month, then you've only got, say, three projects or four projects at the maximum to, to assess, um, and you've got groups of students. So that manages your marking and so on. And one of the things I'd point out about online learning is that because you can track what students do, do, you can have continuous assessment. So I like to have a grid with all the students' names down one side, all the activities I've asked them to do, and then check each week on what they've done. Um, you might give a little grade for that and give feedback to the students. For instance, if a student hasn't done any work that week, just send them an email and say, look, you've got no, got no marks this week, you haven't done anything. Uh, students will quickly learn that they have to work to the schedule that you've given them. So there's a whole section on online collaborative learning in chapter 4.4, and that works well for some subject areas. It's a constructivist approach to teaching, which I've mentioned in an earlier video but it doesn't work in others. But I want to emphasize the important role of the instructor in online collaborative learning, um, where the instructor plays a quite, quite an active role. They provide expert guidance and validate of what's done. They will encourage students to go off and find and read and come back um, and not just give uh, unsupported un, uh, comments and so on. It's a carefully managed discussion based on students prior and subsequent work off, um, outside the group and so on. Uh, but that kind of teaching, class size is critical. You don't want to have too, too many students to manage it in, in, in that kind of environment. But it is a very good way of teaching online. Now you can do that in class, of course, but again, online it's asynchronous, and more flexible than it would be in a classroom environment. So in conclusion, learner support is critical. Uh, without learner support, students fail, and students fail particularly online if you don't get any learner support. So don't just dump content online. Don't just dump all your content into uh, the learning management system and expect the students to do the rest. I once taught in a German university, and the maths professors were very proud that only 5% of students passed because their courses were so difficult. That's not my attitude to teaching. I want all students to succeed. And so I, 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 I feel it's important that we provide students. So I see it's the student's responsibility to learn, certainly, but it's also the instructor's responsibility to help. Um, online workload management is essential, both for you and the students. And independent learning is a critical teachable skill. It's a very important skill that you want students to have. And blended, start gradually with blended learning with just a little bit of online work that has to be done to a deadline and you then you can gradually expand that. But the most important thing for any instructor is to be there for the students, whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. You'll find more information on this in, in the book. There's the link. And the next uh, video is on quality and quality standards.